Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Dr. Bob Ross, I'm President and CEO of the California Endowment. Welcome to our White House Regional Forum on Health Reform. It's hosted by our governors today, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and Washington Governor Chris Gregoire. Thank you. We are also pleased today to be joined by uh, Melody Barnes, and she is the President's Domestic Policy Advisor and the Director of the Domestic Policy Council. Melody, welcome. Uh, we also have from the White House staff, we have Jean Lambrew, who is a senior White House official in HHS. Jean, can you wave your hand? Welcome. This forum clearly comes as a very critical time for our nation and for our states here in California and in Washington. And uh, we have seen President Barack Obama demonstrate enormous leadership in elevating the issue of health reform to national discourse, discussion, and trying to get something done. It's a bold agenda. We know our own governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, is no stranger to this topic. He spent more than a year going up and down the state of California trying to forge consensus on what health reform, what health reform could look like for the state of California. In doing so, he formed a broad bipartisan coalition for consumers, businesses, labor, providers, and insurers that can provide a roadmap for reform for our nation. Here at the endowment, we could not be more pleased to host this forum. Our work is in expanding access to affordable and quality health care but also with an emphasis on prevention, on healthier communities. This is the Center for Healthy Communities. We need a healthier America. A healthier America will be a more productive and competitive America, but will also reduce health care costs. And that's why we see prevention as a critical and important component of health reform. We look forward to assisting and raising this conversation to a national level and wish the President and our congressional leaders well as they take the country down this path. Let me take a moment to introduce uh, many honored guests. All of you are honored guests, and all of you are VIPs, but not all of your names are on this list. <laughs> so you'll have to forgive me, and uh, uh, the responsibility goes with Kim Belshay at the governor's office if your name is not on the list. <laughs> My good friend, Kim Belshay. Uh, California Lieutenant Governor John Garamendi is here. Guam Lieutenant Governor Michael W. Cruz, M.D., is here. Is here. Rolling Hills Estates Mayor Judith Mitchell and President, also she's President of the California League of Cities, is here. Imperial County Supervisor Gary Wyatt, and he's also President of the California State Association of Counties, is here. So. From our own Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, we have County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky. Good to see you. We have Assembly Member Dave Jones, who's Chair of the California State Assembly Health Committee. Good to see you. We have Senator, uh, State Senator Elaine Alquist, who's Chair of the California State Senate Health Committee. And as mentioned, my good friend and colleague, uh, California Health and Human Services Agency Secretary, Kim Belshe. And her counterpart at the Washington State Healthcare Authority is Steve Hill, who's the administrator of that authority. Steve, welcome. We also have Sonoma County Supervisor Valerie Brown, who's president-elect of the National Association of Counties. And Dr. Mehmet Oz, who is also here, and he'll be our facilitator today. This is also part of a statewide conversation, and we have uh, guests joining us on the screens here in uh, Clovis. And that in Clovis, it's hosted by Kings County Supervisor Tony Oliveira and Clovis Mayor Pro Tem Jose Flores. There. In San Diego, hosted by Calexico Mayor Mayor uh, Luis Fuentes and San Diego County Supervisor Greg Cox. 
Good to see you. Greg Cox is a former boss of mine. I hope you still like me, Greg, after what I did there. And in Oakland, we have uh, Mayor Ron Dellums, who is also in Oakland, and also, I believe, in the audience there, should be Congresswoman Jackie Speer. And finally, uh, I have to give a moment just to acknowledge and appreciate the uh, recognition, uh, recognize the uh, support of our own Board of, Super uh, Board of Supervisors. See, I had that old job in my head. Board of Directors here at the California Endowment, and could those members just stand and just be recognized for a moment? Thanks. Uh, with that, uh, we'd also like to make sure that folks know that the, uh, the, the country and state are watching this forum live on Governor Schwarzenegger's website, which is www.gov.ca.gov, and the White House's uh, health care website, which is www.healthreform.gov. And now I want to uh, uh, take an opportunity to introduce uh, our own governor, who has uh, demonstrated tremendous leadership on making this issue of health reform an important one for his administration. And, Governor, we thank you for all that you've done in making California a healthier place. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ross, for the nice introduction and for letting us use your facility here at the California Endowment. We appreciate it very much and also all the work that you're doing Let's give him a big hand for the great work that they're doing. Thank you. I want to say good morning to all of you here. I think it's very important that everyone relaxes. Exhale. Just relax. This is a casual conversation that we're going to have here today. First of all, I want to take the opportunity and say thank you very much uh, to President Obama for uh, putting the spotlight on this very important issue of health reform. Let's give him a big hand. I also want to thank, uh, even though Dr. Ross has gone through all the thank yous and welcoming everybody, I'm glad that you mentioned all those names, so I don't have to do it, but I want to mention some of the names. I want to say, for instance, thank you also to my partner, uh, Governor Gregoire from Washington State, who is here today and who is my co-host. Thank you very much. And then Melody Barnes uh, from the White House, who is the top White House uh, expert in policy and domestic policy. And she's also one of our hosts here today. Let's give her a big hand again. <laughs> we want to thank Dr. Oz. Uh, where did he go? He said right over there. Look at this good-looking guy here, the best-looking doctor around. So thank you very much for being the facilitator here today. Let's give him a big hand again. Then, of course, Secretary Kim Bolshe, who is doing such an extraordinary job for the state of California. Thank you also for your great work. And we want to thank the three cities, uh, Clovis and Oakland and San Diego, to be part of this uh, great discussion here today. Now, obviously, uh, we are talking here about an issue that is uh, very, very complicated. Because otherwise, why is it that in America, Whenever Americans say that you're going to do something, they do it in, the very, in a very short period of time. But when it comes to health care reform, I mean, since Teddy Roosevelt, he has already talked about that every American ought to be insured. He already talked about 100 years ago that we should have universal health care. So why is it that 100 years later we still don't have it? It's because it's a very, very complicated issue. And it's very hard to bring all the stakeholders together. And this is why we are in this disastrous situation. We have in America the best health care. We have the best doctors. We have the best technology. We have the most extraordinary hospitals. We have it all. But our system itself is broken. And we need to fix it. It's inexcusable the country that is the number one country in the world. And let me tell you something. I have been all over the world it is without any doubt the number one country in the world, that we have still 48 million people that are uninsured. In California alone, we have 6.5 million people, 6.8 million to be exactly, uninsured. We have emergency rooms closing because too many people abuse the emergency rooms and go there even though there's no emergency, just because they don't have coverage. 
So we have 60 emergency rooms in the last 10 years closing in California. We see people that are frantic and that are scared and afraid that they're losing their health care because if they have, for instance, if they have a, a, an emergency or a big kind of a medical problem, that their policy gets canceled. We have people that are living in fear because they can't get health care because they can't get the access because of age or because of some medical history. So we have all of those things. And then we have the lack of prevention where there's no incentives for prevention. I think Dr. Ross just mentioned that earlier. It's such an important component to have prevention. Now, we in California, we're very fortunate that we have spent two years debating these issues, having town hall meetings up and down the state of California, and brought all the stakeholders together. And we had three basic principles. One of them was that we want to have everyone insured, mandatory health care uh, for everybody. That creates a bigger risk pool, and that makes sure that the insurance companies then therefore cover everybody. The other thing that we did was we made sure that uh, we bring all the stakeholders together. Because you cannot get health care reform if you don't bring all the stakeholders to the table and listen carefully of what they have to say and then bring them together, and we can talk more about that later on. That's another principle that we had. And, of course, the other one is to make part of the whole health care reform, reform prevention. So those are the important issues that we address. Then, of course, it gets into, you know, uh, e a prescription and it gets into telemedicine and there's other things which I know Dr. Aas is going to address because he's an expert in all this and we're going to have those kind of discussions. But this is really great that we now have a discussion on a national level and that the White House has organized already five other kind of town hall meetings like this all over the country because I know the work that we have done here in California that with the help of the White House and with the help of the federal government that we can have true health care reform this year. The action is now. It is uh, not acting. It will be irresponsible. We've got to act. We've got to create the action, and this is the year where we can do it. And with that, I want to hand it over now to uh, President Obama. Let's watch his video, and let's listen to his message that he has to say. Thank you all for coming together today to participate in a regional White House forum on health reform. Few challenges we face are as complex and consequential as fixing our health system. That's why reforming health care is a top priority for my administration. Our economic crisis has only heightened the urgency of our health care challenge. The crushing cost of health care is battering businesses, squeezing our states, and increasingly imperiling our own budget and threatening our long-term prosperity. And it also directly affects the budgets of families all across this country who face premiums that have doubled over the last eight years. Families who sit around the kitchen table struggling to make impossible choices between paying rent or paying premiums to cover themselves and their children. That's why we recently held a White House forum on health reform that brought together Republicans, Democrats, key stakeholders, and Americans from across the country to discuss reforming our health care system. But we need your help, too. Health reform cannot be achieved through ideas from Washington alone. We are committed to continuing an open, inclusive, and transparent process that allows people from around the country to have a voice and direct involvement in our country's health reform efforts. Because through your own experience, you know what works, what doesn't, and what can be done to help all Americans have affordable, quality health care and to live longer, healthier lives. In December, we asked concerned citizens around the country to hold health care community discussions to tell us your ideas about the problems you face and the solutions you propose. More than 3,000 meetings were held in all 50 states and the District of Columbia and attended by more than 30,000 people. You can read the final report of what we learned from Americans on www.healthreform.gov. And I look forward to hearing your ideas, too. Thank you again for participating in a regional White House forum on health reform. Health reform cannot wait another year. And together, we can ensure that all Americans have quality, affordable health care. Well, you've heard it. Let's get a big hand. Isn't it nice to have a president that is passionate about health reform? I love it. Anyway, our next speaker is going to be Melody Barnes. Please, if you uh, would. Uh, no, uh, sorry. I want to have first uh, Governor Gregoire come out here and to say a few words, and then uh, Melody, please. Uh. 
Well, thank you, Governor, for hosting us and for all of you for coming today. And, Melody, it's a, it's a treat to have you here in your leadership at the White House. Um, you know, I, I have to say that I have heard about health care reform for my first term as governor for four years consistently and asking the question, what are we going to do about it? And I, never, I know Governor Schwarzenegger, like other governors and myself around the country, have tried to do reform. But the fact of the matter is we desperately need leadership in Washington, D.C. for national health care reform. The states alone can't do it. So we're very much welcoming the president's leadership on this very critical issue. And I've noticed with some interest that immediately after he said he wanted to take this issue on, there was this criticism about how, well, you can't take that on because you have to focus on what's going on in the economy, as though the two are separate and distinct. The fact of the matter is I think every governor, Republican or Democrat, would tell you that it's not only a moral imperative, it is an economic imperative. As we look around this country, we can see our private citizens who feel that they are either one diagnosis or one accident away from bankruptcy, whether they have health care coverage or not. And then we see our business community. Take a look at Detroit, where now every automobile that comes off the line, about $2,000 in cost of that automobile, went to health care. Can our businesses afford that? And then take a look at what it's doing to government. I mean, the fact of the matter is, in my state, we've had over a 100% increase in the cost of health care over the last decade, when we've only had a 27% increase in the cost of education. Uh, I, for one, believe that we have got to get our arms around the cost of health care and the quality of health care if we're going to move this country forward to be as competitive as it will need to be uh, in the global economy. As we think about universal access to health care, because I think that's what's brought us all here today, uh, I, I hope we don't just assume that universal access is all that it's about, because the fact of the matter is the current system needs to be put under a microscope and ask how it can be improved I believe cost and quality are key to access, and we cannot separate or lose those from our fundamental mission as we talk today about how do we achieve the kind of health care reform the citizens of this country need and deserve. As I look in my own state, uh, so I don't want to pick on anybody else, I'll pick on my own state. I think we have some interest, interesting statistics. I'll be willing to bet that you'll find those statistics anywhere in the country, but they tell us something about quality of care and cost of care, when for um, bypass surgery, 60% greater likelihood that an individual uh, is going to have bypass surgery if they live in the eastern part of my state than if they live in the western part of my state. Now, I don't know what the reasons might be, but I sure think we ought to ask the question. I think we ought to ask the question why women under the age of 30 are three times more likely to have a hysterectomy if they live outside of Seattle King County than if they do. And I surely think we ought to ask the question about should we be having the dramatic increase in C-sections that we are when we know the consequences and the cost to that. It's not unique in Washington State. It's happening around the country. And we know that the kind of evidence that we now have, best evidence about outcomes that we want to achieve from health care, Really, that's only happening about 50% of the time that best evidence is used in the healthcare arena. So as we look at how do we achieve universal access, we've got to say the current system needs to be looked at. We need to improve the quality. We need to improve on cost if we're going to be able to achieve our ultimate success. So as I come today, I see it as a multifaceted uh, issue for all of us to address. I couldn't be more pleased to work with Governor Schwarzenegger and my colleagues around the country, and I couldn't be more delighted to have the President of the United States stand up and say with the passion that he has that health care reform is at the top of the agenda, that he too sees it as a moral imperative as well as an economic imperative like every governor around the country. With that, again, Governor, thank you for allowing me to join you today, and thanks to all of you for coming. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the individual who's going to give the policy support to the president's initiative, and that's Melody Barnes, who's the director of the Domestic Policy Council. Thank you, Melody, for coming.
Well, thank you so much, Governor Gregoire, and thank you, Governor Schwarzenegger, for having us, and Dr. Ross for your hospitality and everyone who's joined us here today. It is wonderful to be here in California. And for those of you who may have been in Washington, D.C. last week where it was cold and drizzly and rainy, you know it's particularly nice for us to be out here with you today. I want to start off by just reminding everyone about the two years that was the presidential campaign and a promise that President, then-candidate Obama made to everyone. He said, if you elect me president, I'm going to take every step necessary to reform our health care system. And not just because we should, but because we must. We started that with the money that was put in a reserve fund in our budget. We continued that with a health care forum that we held just about a month ago at the White House. And we brought all the relevant stakeholders to the table. People were saying, how are you going to get this done? The last time we tried to do this, people were fighting each other and pushing back on one another. We had hospitals and doctors and nurses, patient advocates, everyone who has a stake in this and representing those who have a stake in this sitting around the table. And I believe that that was the first step or the first set of steps that the president took to make sure that he held true to the promise that he made to the American people. The next set of things that I believe are undeniably true, the reasons why people came to that table, why you're here today, why there were people in Greensboro, North Carolina last week, in Vermont and Iowa, with me out in Dearborn, Michigan about three weeks ago, and that's because everyone realizes, as Governor Gregoire and Governor Schwarzenegger have said, that our economic house is in crisis. Certainly we feel that on the national level as we've tried to deal with the budget issues and the deficit issues. And as Governor Gregoire said, people have said, how can you take this on? We have to take this on. We can't afford not to take this on. And certainly those of you who are small business owners, those of you who are leaders of major corporations also know this to be true. Your bottom line depends on your profitability. Your ability to compete depends on the fact that we get our health care costs under control and that we do that by also bringing people into our health care system. And as the president was saying in the video that we heard a little while ago, people are talking about this at their kitchen tables. Any time that you realize that every 30 seconds someone goes into bankruptcy because of a health care issue, you know you have a crisis. For the last eight years, health care premiums have quadrupled, while people's wages have decreased, and we've seen unemployment go up. So we know that this is something that we have to take on right now. We can feel the momentum in the room. We can feel the momentum and the energy in the air. And we also know that it isn't just leaders that are talking about this on the federal or state or local level, that we have Americans who gathered. People started this at the end of December. I think that's always so interesting because we know it's a time where people are focusing on various holidays and spending time with their families. But people came together in, in fire stations, in their community centers, at their synagogues and at their churches. They came together to speak truth to power and say, this is why, we've got to tell you why we're going to get health care done this year and why that's so important to us. Now, Alice Chen was one of those people who was part of the over 350 health care community discussions that took place in California and in Washington State. And I would love for Alice to tell us about those conversations and what people are telling their leaders about the reason we have to get health care reform done this year. Alice, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. And thank you to President Obama and to Governor Schwarzenegger and Gregoire for your leadership and for hosting us all today. Hi, everybody. My name is Alice Chen. I am a doctor. I specialize in hospital medicine at UCLA. And I'm also part of the leadership of Doctors for America, a new grassroots group of thousands of doctors committed to health care reform. I love being a doctor. I chose medicine because my opportunities have inspired me to want to help others be healthy so that they can pursue their dreams too. But every day, my colleagues and I run into countless frustrations and senseless inequalities in our healthcare system. Two years ago, I took care of a 49-year-old talent agent. He had a long-standing problem with his intestines. 
He was self-employed, and like so many Americans, he lost his health insurance because he couldn't afford it anymore. He was, he was sick for a long time, for many weeks, but the, the county hospital ER had a 24-hour waiting list, so he tried to wait it out. By the time he came to us, he was so sick he could barely walk. And in his hospital bed, he, he lay there typing away on his BlackBerry, um, and his organs gave out one by one. And despite our best efforts, after about a week, he died. I was devastated. I felt like I failed him. And then I realized that really we all failed him as a healthcare system and as a society. He could have been alive these past two years, an active member of his community and his family, but he's dead. And he's only one of the 18,000 uninsured patients who die every year because of our failed system. My patient can't speak for himself anymore, but I can, and that's why I'm here. It's time for us to make things right, no matter what it takes. And I am hopeful uh, because every one of us has a voice, and we are using our voices and speaking up in unprecedented numbers. At Doctors for America, just in a few months, we've, we've grown to over 10,000 doctors who are ready to fight for health care reform. And as the President and, and Ms. Barnes mentioned, over 30,000 people gathered in, in December across America to bring our time and our energy to finding solutions. And over 350 of those discussions happened right here in California and Washington. If we all continue to make this a priority and commit to working together, I know that this time, no matter what it takes, we will succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce uh, a man who is, I think, one of the greatest doctors in the country, great surgeon, a man that uh, we see on television many times, has been on Oprah, has his own television show, talks to us about prevention, about medical problems, and all of those very different issues. It makes it actually kind of pleasant the way he talks to us. Uh, and we are very lucky to have him here today as the facilitator, Dr. Oz. Thank you very much. I have one more person to thank on behalf of, of Dr. Ross, and that's uh, L.A. County Supervisor Mark Ridley-Thomas. Thanks very much. There you are. So I actually, when I'm not on the Oprah show, my day job is to practice cardiac surgery. I'm at New York Presbyterian Hospital. It's a long way from here. But I can tell you the reason that we on the other parts of the country are looking to California is because you guys are on the cutting edge. You're on the bleeding edge, too, sometimes. But, but, but you're on the cutting edge on this deal. And between Dr. Schwarzenegger and Dr. Gregoire, you're looking at two of the nation's biggest proponents and leaders, not just in health care reform, but in health reform. Right, we're, we're proposing legislation, and you guys have already enacted it. So we want to sort of cull through this audience and sort of harvest the, the brain trust we have here to understand what actually happens when you do what you've done, when you've actually reduced cigarette smoking rates to the lowest numbers in the nation, bar one state between these two states, when you, when you have farmers who can bring their foods to market uh, that's been supported through legislation, when you have sodas banned in schools in both states, these are huge movements that we need to understand better. And to do that, we have to have a conversation that spans across the state. So we've got three different parts of the state, north, central, and south represented, and we'll go to them when it makes sense. Uh, we, we also have a conversation that's going to be guided with four fundamental questions. Four questions that can allow us to focus in on issues of cost, of issues of coverage, but also issues of prevention. What does that really mean? I think that some of the answers will blow your mind as you listen to each other talk about it. Now, the fundamental goal for us doing all this uh, was to have an open conversation. If you're not interested really in having consensus, you need to have clarity first. It's like having a dinner table conversation. You're going to fight with people about stuff you care about, which is just fine. But to have clarity, you need to talk to the right people. So we've got testimonials picked out from folks whose stories are as wrenching as Ms. Dr. Park's were just a second earlier. We also have members of this historic, unprecedented, uh, diverse coalition that was crafted in California for health change. And the leaders of that organization, of that coalition, are here. We're going to try to go to as many of them as we can during the course of the hour and a half or so that we have together. Now, we've got lots of time constraints. 
And unfortunately, to hear all these ideas, we, we can only give two minutes to everybody. So uh, I have uh, permission, gubernatorial permission from both of our governors to, enha to enact corporal punishment uh, for anybody who goes longer than two minutes. Uh, but it, think about your comments as an advertisement. Because all we really want to do is to get people to carry the conversation on past this. And if we can do that in an insightful uh, and clear way, then we'll go where we need to be. Now, uh, we, the website's up there. For any of you who forget it, healthreform.gov. The, the California website's gov.ca.gov. Both of them are places that are carry, carrying on conversations. And we culled the first question from the national website, healthreform.com. And it comes from Rebecca. She's located in Los Angeles. She says, I'm just like a Dear Abby question. This is the Governor Schwarzenegger. I'm scared of the rising cost of quality health care and the difficulties in getting health insurance. Previously, I relied on my parents as a young adult. I did that too. Figuring out the health insurance system on my own, and it's very daunting. So her question is, how are rising health care costs impeding businesses and impacting families and individuals? What steps would you recommend be taken by individuals, employers, and governments to reduce those costs? Governor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I think, as I said earlier, it is extremely important that we bring all the stakeholders together and that we reform the system. And this is uh, sometimes easier said than done. I remember the first meeting that we had, had in uh, Sacramento with the stakeholders. There were people sitting there that have uh, been fighting and arguing uh, for years. There were labor leaders on one side and business leaders on the other side that have been arguing. There were consumer groups uh, that were uh, represented. There were the medical association, doctors. There were uh, hospital administrators. So there was uh, all kinds of different groups that have been fighting to, for them to come together and to say, look, each one of you wants to have the ideal situation. But each one of you represent a different group. So what is the ideal situation for you is maybe not the ideal situation for the other people. How do we bring everyone together? You cannot settle and just ask for a straight 10 on health care reform, each one of you, because each one of you's straight 10 doesn't pencil out, doesn't bring us together. You have to settle for a 7 maybe. And the compromise is absolutely the most essential thing. And when the group ag agreed that they could come down and compromise and settle for a compromise and do a 7, that's when the discussions began, and that's when really uh, the real action began in Sacramento with our health care reform. And I think that's what also has to happen on the national level. So that's number one, bringing everyone together. Number two, I think that the key thing is, is to have mandatory health care. I think that will bring the costs down. The more people that are jumping in, like in California alone, we have 6.7 million people that are uninsured, we would have at least 5 million coming into that risk pool. Now you bring the cost down because it's like the cell phones. When we had a few cell phones, it cost $1,600 a cell phone. Now they're down to $100 or less than $100 because everyone is using cell phones and buying cell phones. The same will also be with policies. The costs will come down. The, 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 the third and most important thing is, is that we have to have prevention. Now prevention is very, very important because even though the people are all waiting for government to find a solution, but you know, half of the solution is within you of each individual, if you just think about the power that you have over your own body, if you stop the nicotine addiction, that can already save you a tremendous amount of money and can save the system a lot of money. If you stop eating the junk food, now I have been in the health business uh, and in the fitness business for a long time, I tell you the amount of people that are killing themselves because of eating habits because of eating the amount of calories and getting overweight, the cholesterol goes up, the, fat, uh, the body fat goes up, that causes huge damage to your body and huge medical costs down the line. You have control over that. You have control over your children. Do you want to go and send them to school with fattening foods, with sweets, that would then increase the risk of getting diabetes? Now, diabetes costs a lot of money to our medical system. We can stop that. Of course, there's some people that have hereditarily that problem. I'm not saying that we can erase that immediately, but you can erase the problem when we send our kids to school with sweets and with all the sugar products. That's why we in California were the first state to ban junk food from our vending machines in our public schools. And And also the sodas for our public school, in our public schools and our vending machines and have healthy lunch programs. So there's all kinds of things that you can do. And that's why we have gotten involved in past laws to do a label, uh, the menu labeling and to show the calories so that when people take their first bite, 
they know the dead bite could be 500 calories. <laughs> and a dead bite could mean an hour of life cycle riding or swimming or running. And when people know that information, they will all of a sudden dial back and they maybe will not make that bite. We got to make this information available to people. So that's the power that you have. So don't just look at government, but look at yourself. What do you do? in order to reduce the health care costs. So those are kind of the important things. And I'm very proud that the state of California has made very aggressive moves in those laws and to go in the direction of, of prevention because that's where a lot of the action is. Thank you, Governor. So uh, let's go to a testimony. Abine, uh, I heard that your husband missed a payment. Is that right? Just, just missed one payment? All right, so what happened? Well, my husband was a 30-year contractor, uh, painting contractor. And we had um, barely, you know, we, we struggled with making payments for a lot of bills because we got paid when our people paid us. So we didn't get monthly payments. And so we didn't have insurance for our employees, but we had individual Kaiser insurance policies for both of us. And he was played tennis every day, Governor. He was out on the tennis court, and he had a heart attack. And... Um, he was home recuperating. It was a pretty massive heart attack. He was home recuperating, and I got mail. He had been paying the bills. I got mail that both of our policies had been canceled. So I got mine reinstated because I didn't have a problem, and I went out and got him a high-risk Blue Cross policy. Um, about eight months after that, he was diagnosed with leukemia, and um, he was had two types of leukemia, so he, they said he wasn't going to make it. They flew in an experimental drug from Philly and administered the drug, and he was in a coma for 23 days. While he was in the coma, um, the hospital called me and said, your insurance isn't going to cover um, his treatment, and you need to um, get help. So I petitioned Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal turned me down because I had an old rusty car in the garage, which was the one thing that made me have excess property. It was a car that I hoped one day to get fixed up, you know. Um, and so I appealed to Medi-Cal. But in the meantime, it took nine months before I went before the administrative law judge again. But I remember at one time sending seven pounds of bills to my mom just so she could put them in order so I could pay $5 to this person and $25 to that person so that I could keep him so he would continue getting coverage. Um, and um, I ended up eventually with like $800,000 worth of medical bills because a year later in April he was diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, so what happened? Sent home with hospice and he died three months later. I did win the Medi-Cal appeal but it took so long that I had depleted every money, all my pension, my savings, our stocks, everything we had. Abinay Pillar, thank you very much. You know, you're not alone. <laughs> you know, I, I wish you weren't. I mean, I, unfortunately, there were so many folks you could have had tell a story just like that. And it pains all of us to have the health care system that you heard the governor speak to and not be able to, to dole it out as we think makes sense. I think one of the challenges we're going to face is how to actually make it go more evenly across the way. And uh, I think there are some ideas. And, and I should ask one of our thought leaders, Lloyd Dean, who's a head of the Catholic Healthcare West system, talk a little bit about, about health information and what role that might play. In fact, today, just coincidentally, uh, we launched this, this big initiative called the, the Health Fault Initiative at my hospital. There's an article in the New York Times today that sort of talks about how these kinds of problems could be avoided if we actually understood what was happening more globally ahead of time and tie those pieces together. Thanks for your story. Thank you, Dr. Oz. As one of the many uh, leaders of some of the nation's largest uh, provider system, and as I look around the room, uh, my colleagues and exec other uh, executives, let me just say that uh, we get it, uh, that the cost of health care in this country and the escalation of that cost on a year-over-year -year basis is not sustainable. That is not up for the debate. But the issue, ladies and gentlemen, is what do we do about it? 
And we are very appreciative of the president, of the governors, of all of the members of the team of the White House uh, that are calling folks like us together and saying, there's got to be a better way. We need your help. And we have some ideas. We have some thoughts. Wellness has to be a part of the solution, unequivocally. Prevention has to be a part of the solution. And health information technology. What has been in healthcare our ATM that we all associate with banking? We know that technology can help us with better outcomes. We know that it can help us with cost. We know that health care, uh, that uh, health IT can help us as it relates to safety. So we know there is a better way. We concur with the governors and the president that if we put our minds together and if we come together, that we can address this very, very crucial issue. But at the end of the day, it's not about technology. It's not about buildings. It's about better health for individuals. And we as providers, uh, we commit ourselves to being a part of the solution. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Thank you. So questions? You've heard uh, Abedin. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Raz. Uh, My name is Dave Ganadev. I'm a trauma and vascular surgeon uh, at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, which is a county hospital for 28 years, taking care of underinsured and uninsured. And this year, I also happen to be the president of 35,000 member of California Medical Association. And thank you, Governor, for uh, trying it. I know we came this close, but no cigar. I say, that's a bad word. No, no tobacco here. Uh, so, but, uh, but I, and also, Melody, it's really, really appreciate what President is doing. The doctors of California want three things in healthcare reform. Number one, universal coverage with portability. You can leave a dead end job and go elsewhere. You don't need to be stuck in a dead end job because of healthcare coverage. And universal access. Just because you have coverage doesn't mean that you have access. Medical patients in California, six million people do not have a decent access to primary care, do not have any access to specialty care. It's a real problem. So we want both of them. Next one is quality care and preventive care. We, we, you talked about preventive care. Why should there be a fast food restaurant next to a high school? I don't see a reason. Why? Why should not, why should not we ask the developers to put walking trails when they, build, when they build new tracks. These are the simple things we can do. And primary care, the country is in real trouble, and California especially is in tri real trouble because we have lack of primary care physicians. So we need to emphasize that. And the last one is cost control with a serious insurance reform. You know that billions of dollars went out of California to Wall Street and elsewhere. I think it's about time we did some serious insurance reform. When they take the premium, let them spend 90% of that on patient care. And with that, we'll be solidly behind President and you in the health care reform. Thank you. I think that uh, it is uh, one of the uh, things, all the points that you mentioned, you're absolutely correct. And I think that uh, uh, the key thing is, is in part of our reforms that we had is that 85 percent of uh, the, the revenues that come in has to be spent on health care, on patients. And I think that's very important. And also the other point that you mentioned of uh, having everyone insured, I think that everyone, no matter how many disagreements we have about the different issues, but I think there is a commonality there that everyone agrees that we should have everyone insured, number one. Everyone should be part of the risk pool, and everyone should have access. And um, I think that the only way that we can make insurance companies 
give access to everyone and make sure that they don't ever reject anyone because of age or because of medical histories if everyone is part of that risk pool because that provides them more money, brings the costs down, and enables them cost-wise to then cover everybody. But I think those are absolutely essentials in order to really have true health care reform. And I think that uh, the important thing, as you also stressed, is, again, prevention, which is so important because uh, I think that we, as I said earlier, we have the power to go and to have, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of control ourselves of how we eat, if you smoke or don't smoke, if you exercise, bring the, down our cholesterol level and so on. But it's also important that insurance companies and uh, employers uh, you know, offer incentives for that. We have uh, Steve Bird here uh, from uh, Safeway, who is the CEO of Safeway, who we hope we hear from later on uh, about why was it that during the time when we have increase in health care costs and skyrocketing health care costs, in his company, the health care costs went down by 13% uh, a year, in one year alone. So, I mean, that just shows you that if you handle it the right way and if you use those principles, that you can bring down health care costs. Richard, just to emphasize one point that was made earlier, and it gets back to Abinay's point, that the, the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country is actually illness. And bankruptcy, by the way, will take eight years off your life unless you have some social network to catch you. And of the top ten stressors in life, five of them are financial. So these stories work together very closely, which is why I think uh, the, the point of view of the, of the president's uh, group on this is so important that this is the right time because we have to make the decisions now. Uh, our satellites have been sitting by very, very patiently. I'm going to go to San Diego in the southern part of the, of the state and, and speak to, to Supervisor Cox. How are you, Supervisor? Doing great. Take it away. Take it away. Well, uh, in, in answer to the question that was presented to us earlier, uh, obviously the, imp the individual has to take on greater responsibility. There's no question about that through their lifestyles, through uh, accessing the appropriate level of, of health care. Certainly in San Diego, we're very blessed to have a lot of community clinics, and it would certainly help our hospitals a lot, particularly their emergency rooms, if we could convince individuals to go to a community clinic as opposed to waiting to something becomes catastrophic and going to an emergency room. Obviously, we need to work with employers in, in developing health care plans that are fair and equitable to both the employers and the employees. That's very, very important. And obviously, we need to focus on uh, how we're dealing with uh, the reform of health care. You know, one of the things that has to come out of this, it has to become a more simplified process. Uh, strictly creating another layer of, of government or another uh, bureaucracy is not going to be the way to address that particular issue. So, you know, in San Diego, we, we feel blessed. We have a, a good safety net, but it needs to be improved a lot, and that's why we are so excited about the efforts of President Obama and Governor Schwarzenegger and the entire administrations uh, at the state and federal level to focus on this issue. We also have a testimony here in San Diego from a gentleman that is by the name of uh, Rinaldo Hernandez. He is somebody that can give some real live testimony in regards to health care. He's a 35-year uh, practitioner of uh, being an insurance agent, so he's seen it from that side. But he's also had some issues more recently because of the not only the affordability, but the accessibility of health care. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Rinaldo Hernandez to uh, provide a testimony on behalf of San Diego County. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Cox. As uh, uh, I grew up uh, being covered by my parents' insurance, uh, who schooled and, and into college, and after college I went into the military, was covered by their insurance. And then after getting out of the military, I uh, went to work for a major insurance company as an agent uh, and was covered by them for all those years. So I always felt very safe in having that special uh, protection because we all want to feel safe and secure. I found, though, that over the years of handling many different types of insurance, that the type that was the most frustrating to me was a medical insurance, uh, trying to help clients uh, secure medical coverage. Uh, in most cases, it was trying to help them uh, afford it. But over the years, I found uh, increasingly it became very difficult for them to qualify for it. And so I also realized that... Uh, it was happening to other people, but that it might happen to me, but probably not. So I saw that toward the end of my career uh, that uh, uh, the affordability and that issue of uh, being able to qualify, all of a sudden uh, when I had to pay for it myself, which occurred in the late 90s, uh, the cost was not horrendous, but then I found uh, in the 
uh, when I went into the years 2000 and had to carry the entire cost myself, I was shocked to find out how rapidly it was increasing to the point that uh, in old middle 2000, uh, the cost had for me and my wife had uh, exceeded uh, $1,000 a month. And uh, by the time we went into 07, it uh, was over $1,300 a month, plus co-pays and other things, pushing the cost up uh, between fifteen and $1,800 a month. The latter part of 07, we found it just broke us financially. Uh, and so uh, we were faced with the same issue that many people are faced with, trying to find coverage. I didn't qualify. Well, you have to go out to the private market and buy insurance. Uh, if you don't need it, you qualify. I needed it. I didn't qualify. We were able to secure some coverage for my wife. It was a pretty stripped-down policy, still costing over $500 a month. There was medical care that she needed, but we knew that if she went and sought that medical care, she wouldn't qualify for that private policy. And so that distressed me that she had to uh, suffer for those months. And then when we finally got coverage for her, uh, I still was uninsurable. Fortunately, it only took about a year for me to qualify for Medicare, so I was safe there. But I've looked at the situation of over the years of so many clients who either couldn't afford it or who they could afford it, couldn't qualify for it. There's got to be something wrong there. That's, I grew up in this country that uh, I knew I had the right to an education, and if I got in trouble with the law, I had a right to a defense. Why don't I have a right to have health care? We've just heard heart-wrenching stories uh, from across, across the, the state, and I'm sure this is happening across the nation. Uh, but I want to thank Governor Schwarzenegger, because who more than to speak about the enthusiasm about preventative health care and to doing things in this state and setting the model and the standard for the rest of the nation. You heard his optimism about we can fix this, we can do things that will have an impact on lowering health care costs. And I think... Uh, we can become leaders, as he's done in a lot of other areas. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is my generation, where 30% of my generation, younger generation, don't have health insurance either, or they can't afford it. And this is something that ha has a, a future effect on our nation's productivity. I think we can have a discussion about increasing our economic uh, recovery or becoming a global leader again, or making any reforms in that aspect without touching upon health care, because this is a priority for our workforce. Those that are in the front lines making our companies the, the most competitive in the nation, the, in the world, but this is a heavy, heavy weight to, to bear when they fear of becoming ill and not having coverage. They fear that their children may become ill and they don't know what they're going to do. And they go into the bankruptcy uh, that was talked about. I don't think th that you can become a productive nation with this burden on people's backs. This is why I, uh, I, this is why I voted for Governor Schwarzenegger twice. Uh, this is why I think that who better than somebody who has been fit his whole life uh, can, can talk about these things. I believe that educating our younger generation about healthy activities, about getting up and exercising, about eating properly, about eating right, will also lower the health uh, costs for the future. I think it has to also be tied with what California has done on the green side, on the revolution uh, that our governor has also been a leader in, because if we can practice Renewable, uh, renewable energy practices and install things that have a healthier environment for our kids. Um, they can also breathe better. We have high levels of asthma in my community. Many, many children suffer from asthma. And so I think that if we can lower the costs and if we can make it more accessible for all generations, we can have successful health reform. And I applaud President Obama for taking uh, this to the, on the road and, and getting input from all the communities. Thank you. Mayor Fuentes, thank you very much. By the way, if you live closer than a football field from a major four-lane highway, you ought to move. 
uh, because there's no way for us to clean the air there well enough. And that's a major issue that Mayor Fuentes brought up that's particularly important for, for California, although you are, like in most of these areas, a little bit more ahead of uh, the rest of the country. You know, so the last person I wanted to ask to speak on cost, which is that first big question, I remember I spoke about four questions before, is a gentleman who re represents uh, one of the largest unions in the country, and the re people, members of his union, are the ones who take care of you when you go to the hospital. These are the service workers, the folks that actually are the front line, uh, oftentimes making sure the places that you're staying are clean and, and habitable. Dennis Rivera. Thank you. Um, for us, the healthcare workers working with our uh, uh, employers, we, have, we believe that one way that we can control costs is by improving the quality of the care that we give. So we have created a coalition called the Partnership for Quality Care, and the effort is to try to identify the protocols throughout the country that could get the biggest uh, uh, and the best results. And uh, what we have found out that is uh, that 20% of our patients consume 80% of the outcome of our costs. So if we, could, particularly those are patients who have chronic diseases like uh, heart diseases, uh, obesity, uh, diabetes. So what we have done is basically we have got together the best practices around the country, the best outcomes, and uh, we have published a report to that effect. And I believe that if we as a nation do that, we can uh, control the costs and improve the quality of our care. Thank you very, very much. Beautifully stated, so accurate. Thank you. So that was cost. We covered, yes, please. Yeah, I, I put on my mic. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, but I, uh, I think it's very interesting what you just said, and it's absolutely true. As a matter of fact, he said 20% of the people create, you know, the, the, the huge costs. There's a story that was just recently in the paper about Texas. I don't know if anyone read that, but it was nine patients. Nine patients uh, created uh, at the hugest cost, like millions and millions of dollars. They together over a period of a year had um, 3,600 uh, uh, emergency room visits, just amongst nine patients. Think about that. So this is just the, um, uh, the, the, the craziness about it, that people use and abuse emergency rooms, and this is why so many emergency rooms are closing down. So if we have everyone covered, then you can send patients that are having maybe a headache or a toothache or some other minor problem that is not really an emergency to a local clinic where it costs, first of all, maybe just 20% of the costs when they go into the emergency room. So there's all kinds of things that we can do in right in that area in order to cut down the costs of health care. Thank you. No, it's, it's absolutely, amazingly, that's actually where the huge opportunities present themselves to us. And it takes us actually into the second big topic. So we talk with costs. We'll come back to issues like costs because we're going to talk about affordability and making sure that everyone gets coverage. But uh, Governor Gregoire, let me talk to you a little bit about a question that got asked again on, on healthreform.gov. Uh, and it's from Robin in Olympia, your state. Uh, she submitted a comment uh, asked, saying that the, she wants to discuss the need for government systems that are concerned with prevention and health, and health issues. So these two different things. So we talked about prevention. Both governors have spoken about it. And we talked a little bit about how you manage diseases. How do you get those systems to actually work together so you don't have these individual silos? And how do you get communities and government to partner on prevention? Her specific question uh, is, is how do you actually lower costs if you do this and how do you improve Health. How do you give us some granular ideas of programs that might work, ones you might recommend? You know, not not pie-in-the-sky ideas, but things maybe you've actually worked on and got legislated uh, in Washington. And what kinds of things can the public and private sector do together in America to make it happen? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's very interesting when we look at prevention, as you've spoken to it, Governor. Uh, the fact of the matter is 50% of the health care costs in America today relates to exercise, nutrition, substance abuse, and tobacco use. So it's very clear that we can reduce the cost and enhance quality of our own wellness if we take on these four fundamentals. And I look with much trepidation at this new generation of children and ask myself, how in the world in this country can we have a generation of kids who predictably are going to have a reduced lifespan than their parents? And it is related to the issue of nutrition in particular. So what we've done, for example, in both California and Washington State, is set up a partnership where in our schools now we are really emphasizing nutrition, getting rid of the sodas, getting rid of the junk food, and in my particular state, a partnership with local farmers so that the farmers are bringing in the food that's very nutritional for these students, and we're going to, I hope, see the results uh, very soon. 
Uh, one other thing I want to talk about in terms of prevention, we, we've got a study going in our state with our public employees where we've asked them to go online and voluntarily take their own test to see how they are physically doing in confidence, but they volunteer to do it. Now we've honed down on 2,000 of those state employees, and we've said, how about we look a little more closely at you? Will you volunteer? And they have. So we've had uh, some tests administered to these individuals, and the results of which are very interesting. Not only do they have health risks, but they didn't know they had these health risks. Their cholesterol levels, their blood pressure, and so on. So now they have volunteered to go into a regime where they're taking responsibility, personal responsibility for their own health care, and they're seeing dramatic differences. One, because they were educated about what was personally wrong with them, and two, what they could do to take personal responsibility. Now we're looking at taking the next step, which is how do we incent these folks with their, their health care coverage by giving them a break on the cost of their health care if they will enroll in a program like this and do so in a meaningful way. So when the, uh, Robin from Olympia, Washington asks the question, I think it's we all have to take personal responsibility. We're trying to encourage it with our youth. We cannot, as a nation, allow this generation of kids to have a reduced lifespan. But we also know it's a partnership with the employee and the employer. It's a partnership, whether it's in the public or the private sector, of finding new ways to educate our employees and let them engage in the kind of wellness programs that they will do if they have the knowledge base to do so. Beautifully answered. Thank you very much. So both governors, we've talked a lot about prevention broadly, but one of the issues that prevention also offers the nation is the ability to take better care of the, the sacred activity of food that we eat. And uh, there are infections that keep rising up over and over again through these issues. And Avenay's story, which was very compelling, and she told us about her husband who missed a payment, uh, is paralleled uh, by other stories in this audience. And I'm going to ask Carol Moss to uh, talk a little bit about a, a, a small infection that happened in her family. Carol? Thank you. Or should I? Okay. We'll sit, we'll sit over here. Look, look to the camera. Okay. Smile. Thank you. Makeup, please. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wanted makeup, but the government didn't believe in it. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Carol Moss, and I'm founder of Niles Project. Um, we educate the public on infection prevention. Last year, with the Consumers Union, it, Senator Elaine Alquist, our Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Senator Dean Flores, we made California safer by implementing two new laws that will prevent infections. 36 million Californians will be safer in California going into hospitals today because the legislation that was supported by our leadership will protect patients from getting infections in the hospital. My passion began, began in healthcare reform, focus on patient safety and prevention. The day I realized my son, Niall Calvin Moss, who was 15, died of a preventable staph infection that he got in the hospital. It was superbug MRSA. Now an epidemic, an epidemic without statistics. One of the preventable infections that you get in the hospital that ends lives abruptly for nearly 99,000 Americans every year. Prevention can be two different kinds. It can be many kinds. I want to thank President Obama for healthreform.gov. This is exactly what all of us need to be able to go on that site and have every hospital that wants to provide care in our nation to report their infection rate. Had I known that hospitals infected people, that you could get infections by going in the hospital, I would have gone to that site and I would have said, is this hospital safe for my son? Three years ago, Easter, my husband, Ty, who's in the back of the room, and I, um, lost our son after he underwent a series of tests in a local hospital in Orange County. It was just an MRI, lots of tests, neurological tests. Niall was born with hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain. So for 15 years of his life, we spent lots of time in the hospitals, and not once. In 15 years, did one person, not one healthcare worker or doctor, not one person said, be careful. When you're in the hospital, there is dangerous bacteria, even on the elevator buttons, on different places, that is highly contagious. 
And this is what we've learned. Thank you very much. Oh, she's, I'm sorry about him. You know, the one thing about MRSA, you don't just get it in the hospitals. Right. Right, you get it, we're having it all through the communities. And probably the most contaminated thing in the hospital is, you know that little clicker you get to change the television station? No, no one ever cleans that. Right, I would like to add a statement here. Since we're looking for solutions, and since the CDC just recently came out with a report that said, and this was in March of 2009, with existing techniques, the CDC can save over 99,000 lives and $31 billion a year. All that they need is enforcement. We need our country, President Obama. We need to enforce these preventative measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. So prevention comes in many forms. One of them is to make sure we have access to information. Uh, Lloyd spoke earlier about that. But we also have prevention uh, argued for leaders, part of that, that miraculous coalition that came together around health reform in this, in this state. And Governor Schwarzenegger mentioned Steve Berg earlier. Uh, Steve is uh, the CEO of Safeway. He's been a, a, a leader in creating a coalition of employers who want to make a difference for the people who work for them because it makes financial sense. It's good politics and it's good policy. Steve. All right, thank you. Uh, it's difficult to follow that story, but uh, let me just talk a little bit about um, prevention and wellness and its uh, link to cost control. Um, I've come to believe that you don't really solve you don't really solve the healthcare problem in this nation unless you control costs, and you don't control costs unless you make America healthier. And so, what we we discovered about four years ago is about 70% of the health care costs in this nation are driven by people's personal behaviors. So being a self-insured employer of some 200,000 people, we designed our own health care plan to create the incentives that you were looking for a moment ago. So we have incentives for healthy behavior in our company. Uh, and if you just think about it, we're all familiar with automobile insurance. And the better your driving record, the lower your cost of automobile insurance. We basically adopted that model. And so in our company, your behavior essentially becomes a form of currency, and you use that currency to buy down your premium. And so a couple of the key things that we're focused on, we're focused on the four largest chronic conditions. And so if you, if you have a body mass index north of 30 and are considered obese, um, you would have a different premium than somebody who's less than 30. If you are a non-smoker, you have a lower premium. It's okay to have high cholesterol, but it's not okay for it not to be controlled. It's okay to be genetically predisposed to hypertension, but it needs to be under control. And so if you have all of those things under control, in our company, your health care premium is 25 to 50 percent lower than those that do not have it under control. And it just makes enormous sense. I did a calculation that you might appreciate. Uh, if the nation had adopted Safeway's health care plan in 2005, the national health care bill, instead of being $2.3 trillion today, would be $600 billion less. You're correct. The first year we did it, we had a 13% reduction. We're now into our fourth year. We've added benefits to the program, so we flatlined our costs at a time when all other businesses are up 36%. And, you know, I think if you could remove the politics from health care, I believe that this problem is no more difficult than a seventh-grade algebra problem. We absolutely have to get costs under control. I've been uh, a supporter of universal coverage of health care for 15 or 16 years, but let's get control of the costs, then we can get the coverage, and then we can solve most of the problems that are being discussed here today. Before I go back to the governors, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Steve Bird from Safeway. I, want, I, I was just canvassing the room. We, we've got one world expert in the room on prevention, and it might actually help address Dennis Rivera's point about the 80-20 rule that 20% of folks drive most of the costs. And then we'll go to the governors to talk about hospital prevention, general prevention, and lifestyle changes. Dean Ornish uh, from California. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oz and governors and Melody Barnes and President Obama. It's a privilege to be here today. And I just want to build on what uh, Steve Bird talked about because we work together in helping develop this program. It turns out that 75% of the healthcare costs are caused by four conditions, heart disease, prostate or breast cancer, diabetes, and obesity, all of which are preventable in most cases simply by changing diet and lifestyle. 
I also want to just salute you because your work has brought together the kinds of things that President Obama has talked about, Republicans and Democrats, labor and management, all working towards a common goal that affects all of us. Uh, and uh, our research has shown that our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing themselves and much more quickly than we had once realized if we simply stop doing what's causing the problem, which are these lifestyle choices that we make. And what makes it sustainable is that these mechanisms are so dynamic that you feel so much better so quickly. It, it's not about fear of dying, it's about joy of living because it's joy that's sustainable. People with heart disease who can't walk across the street because they have such severe chest pain, in most cases become pain-free in just a few weeks simply by changing lifestyle. We think it has to be a new drug or a new laser, something really high-tech and expensive to be powerful. And in our research, we use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art measures to prove how powerful these very simple, low-tech and low-cost changes can be. We even published a study last year showing that even your genes change when you change your lifestyle. We found over 500 genes change in just three months, in effect turning on the disease-preventing genes, turning off the genes that promote breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, and other illnesses. And so if we want to make health care, real health care, not what Senator Harkin calls sick care, available to the 48 million people who don't have it, we need to really address these underlying issues because otherwise if we do universal coverage without also addressing these deeper behavioral issues, then our costs are going to go up. And the final question that I want to have is, is that having seen what a powerful difference these changes can make, why is it that 97% of our health care dollars are really disease care dollars and go for treatment, operations, and drugs rather than these simple changes that can be so powerful? Thank you. Thank you. Governor Schwarzenegger, they will go right down the line if it's okay. Just thoughts on any of the three topics, uh, preventing well, infections in hospitals, general corporate role, and, and you know, turning off genes that cause cancer. Well, I think that uh, it is very clear that uh, one of the most, I mean, touching stories was from Abuna, who um, uh, you talked about, uh, you know, how your policy was canceled. And that's what I was talking about earlier. I mean, this is unacceptable. You know, that you have a policy, that you have to live in fear even though you have a policy. Because you know and you read it in the papers and you hear it in the news often that insurance companies can cancel you or will cancel you if you all of a sudden have some medical problem that could cost them a lot of money. They will go through and they will find the dots and the, 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 the T's that are not crossed and they say, hey, you lied on your application and bang, you're gone. So those are the kind of things that happen and uh, those are the things that will be erased if we have universal health care, if everyone is covered. And it should never happen that someone gets their policy canceled. It should never happen that you can't get insurance because of your age or because of your medical condition or because of your medical history or anything like this. Those things ought to be erased. It's absolutely essential. And we did that in our reform here in California. As a matter of fact, with Secretary Kimball Shea's leadership, we got to that point. So I think that now it is important that we work together with uh, the federal government with the White House, uh, with President Obama, and I think that we can uh, accomplish that this year. I think it's a key thing. That's why I said action is now. We've got to go and move forward, and that's why this town hall meetings are so great. And thank you so much in sharing this. It must be very painful for you, so thank you for coming in here today. Let's give another hand of applause for this, uh, you know, terrific story that gives us a lot of insight. Thank you. You know, Governor, we, we were joking about this yesterday, but in surgery, again, which is what I normally do when I'm not doing this, uh, your biggest enemy is indecision. And, and so you're, you're better off making a mistake, not a big one, but making a mistake and fixing it than not going anywhere because eventually that ends up you taking a toll. And I think that's a process uh, uh, that we're looking at today because I, I don't think the nihilistic thoughts around this problem really are appropriate. We have a lot we can do to make a difference. I applaud you. Melody, thoughts, especially at the national level, it was, Dr. Warner's – he didn't talk about this, but he's done some groundbreaking work showing you can actually reverse heart disease, disease no, reverse heart disease, and reverse prostate cancer. These are big deals in our nation, and yet we have a difficult time at a national level getting some of these things funded. Yet it's very easy for me to get paid to do heart surgery. Absolutely, and thank you for that. I think a couple of things. Even before we started this conversation, you know, think back. It seems like a long time ago, but it was just about two months ago when we started at the beginning of the administration with the Recovery Act, and some of the investments that we made at that point 
We had to stimulate the economy, but at the same time, we had to lean into the reforms that were so important for this conversation. So a billion dollars for prevention of the kind of prevention that you're talking about. Um, money invested for healthcare information technology. Signing the children's health legislation, an important step in the right direction. All of those were things that we did at the, at the beginning of the administration. The president also said, I want everyone around the table. I want everything on the table. But at the same time, he walks into the room. All of us who work for him walk into the room with values and principles that we consider important. And as I have listened to your stories, as I have listened to experts on this issue, I've reflected back on that. And I just want to mention a couple of those things. You know, before we heard what you had to say, I want you to know that we were listening and thinking about this ahead of time. He talks about investments in prevention and wellness. That's an important value, an important principle. Improving patient safety and quality. That's something that you were talking about. And I'm so sorry about what happened to your son as I am with your husband. Um, talking about protecting families from bankruptcy or debt because of, because of health care costs. Assuring affordable quality care for all people. I could go on through this list, making sure that we control costs and that we bring everyone into the system because those two things are so connected to one another. So as we go forward, and I, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about this in a few minutes, and as you help us move forward on this issue, know that these are the values and the principles that we walk into um, the conversation with Congress to make sure that this legislation and gets on the pre president's desk and signed this year. Governor, Governor Gregoire. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that strikes me is that, as the governor indicated, this is a very complex system. And we can touch one part of it and have an in inadvertent consequence on the other. But imagine if we could share the outcomes that we're seeing uh, across the nation of things that are going positively, whether it's at Safeway or a little project that started in Washington State where we have now every hospital and every surgery doctor that have a checklist that they must go through. It's a simple idea. It's no different than an airline pilot checklist. But as simple as that may sound to all of us, the fact of the matter is it has a study now shown it would result in $25 billion in savings in health care costs. The ability for us to share these stories around the nation with the leadership of you, Melody, and, and President Obama so that we can learn from each other because there are opportunities out there to seize not only how do we enhance quality, how do we reduce costs and thus have universal access, but how do we also take personal responsibility and make things better. So I am passionate about this issue. I think it is, as I said earlier, a moral imperative. I think it is, as the President has said, an economic imperative. Uh, and I think working together as we have come together here today is the way in which we will get this job done with the passion and the belief in the result that we have to achieve this year. We can no longer afford to look the other way on health care reform. reform. Today is the day. Let us begin. Thank you all for what you're doing and coming here today. Right. Uh, excuse me. Thank you, Governor. A lot of I just would like to uh, ask you a quick question because there's one thing that you didn't bring up yet, uh, and that is you're very passionate about children and about health care, and you put the two together, and now you're fighting for uh, getting uh, coverage for all the children in your state. You maybe want to address this just quickly as kind of like a stepping stone to get overall coverage and where the funding comes from in order to get this done. Well, we, we did. Thank you, Governor. We did start with a – I had a Blue Ribbon Commission that I chaired. We went around the state, and we said, you know, it starts with our children. We need to have universal care for our kids. We set a goal of 2010 for all our children having access to health care in the state of Washington. We've struggled in these tough economic times, but with the President having just signed the new S-CHIP bill for children's health care in the nation, we're going to achieve that goal. One thing we found along the way, however, was it was one thing to say every child will have access to insurance. It was another thing to say every child will have access to a provider. So we had seen other states struggle with this, giving health care insurance, and then finding that the children couldn't get access to a provider, or it took weeks, months, or years to get access. So we have stepped up to our reimbursement rates uh, as a state in our partnership with the federal government, making sure that we are getting access to health care providers. The result has been very dramatic. We set another goal of all citizens having access to health care by 2012. Uh, unfortunately, 
We don't know that we can make it, but with the leadership of President Obama, we're determined now, renewed determination to make it. But we now are uh, covering all kids within 300% of poverty. We have a new partnership with the private sector to make sure all children over 300 have access. So I'm very proud in Washington State that we set that as a priority. But more importantly, we actually have gotten the job done. Thank you very much. And uh, the great, great leadership. And Dr. Oz, I have a question for you before you go on to Oakland or whatever city you're going to go to. I see you already getting ready, like a racehorse jumping at the, at the thing. But just because I want to make sure before we finish it that we address this issue of uh, e-prescription, because we have in California alone a 1,000 patients die, a 1,000 people die because of misreading of a prescription. It's a huge amount if you think about a 1,000 people. I don't even know what's nationwide. And also about telemedicine and about technology and having all the medical information uh, in, uh, electronically uh, available in any hospital. And so maybe you can address the importance. I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief just to keep us on schedule, but, but it makes no sense for physicians to use an 18th century technology, a paper and a pen, in a 21st century world. And that article that I mentioned earlier uh, in the New York Times is, uh, is written because it was the inauguration of a, ver a very different way of thinking about health care. So, you know, when you buy things on the Internet and uh, you, you use a, a PayPal-type system so it makes you comfortable that what you're doing is safe, but you own the credit card, it's your material, your money, that's what we need to do with health care records. And so there are companies, Google is doing this, uh, Microsoft is doing this through Health Vault. Large companies and small companies are making it possible for you to own your health records, which means that doctors and hospitals will put the information in the record, but it's yours. If you go to a different doctor, you own that record. You take it where you want to go. And that also means that all hospitals and doctors, I think the, pro, the stimulus package uh, uh, amendment that are, are component that, that actually gives doctors and hospitals money if they do this and ultimately probably penalizes if we don't, is for, going to force us to be digital. 10% of us are right now, 10% of the hospitals. We need to be in the 80s and 90s. We'll give all that information to your personal site that has all your information, including your prescription information. That means when you go to the pharmacy and you fill it, you'll automatically know, or, and, and the pharmacist will know if you've got a drug-drug interaction because all your drugs will be there. And you know what? If you go buy an extra herb or a vitamin or some over-the-counter medication, you'll also know if that would interact with something that your doctor wrote for you. So, for example, if you're taking birth control pills, and you take St. John's wort because you're a little depressed, well, St. John's wort blocks birth control pills. I mean, that's really depressing. <laughs> so these are the kinds of things. That's a simple one, but there's some big-time problems that happen. And, you know, the most expensive health care is bad health care. I think that's fundamentally what we're hearing from everyone up here, and each of you as well. I mean, not you know, missing a, a payment. He still cost more money to all of us, your husband, before he died, than if he'd been on top of it. Same for MERS and all these other issues. But Clovis, in the central part of the state, has been very patiently waiting near Fresno. Uh, Mayor Tempora uh, Flores, how are you? Real good. Welcome, Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz. And I want to welcome all your viewers, your viewers. here in uh, the Central Valley of California. We are blessed. We are located next to beautiful national parks. We have one of the um, most fertile city, fertile, excuse me, fertile valleys of this world. And, but we're also grappling with problems. We have issues of poverty. We have issues of education. But we also have issues of health care. Our major health care issue is that we're a growing population. Our elderly population is growing. Our young population is growing. And those are two populations that often use uh, medical care more often than others. We also have issues in, these, in our rural communities with access to medical care. We are far away from cities. We're far away from quality medical care. Today here in Clovis, we have an educator. Not only is he a medical doctor, but he's educating the new doctors that are coming that will offer health care to uh, our citizens. Without further ado, I'll present Dr. Juan Carlos Rubalcaba. Good morning. Um, my name is Juan Carlos Rubalcaba. I'm a family physician at UCSF Fresno. I train residents to become family doctors. I also work at Clinica Sierra Vista, which is a community health center. Uh, especially in diabetes, asthma, and obesity. 
I truly believe if patients have better access to health care and prevention programs, we can then better manage these conditions and prevent some of the complications. Uh, let me share, share a quick story with you. I have a patient in the hospital now. Uh, he's 34 years of age. He is morbidly obese. He weighs approximately 400 pounds. He suffers from hypoventilation syndrome, and he has a tracheostomy tube to help him breathe. He already suffers from heart failure, kidney failure, and he is on 10 different medications. He is mostly bedridden. You could say he is a prisoner in his own body. Remember, he's only 34 years of age. Perhaps five or 10 years ago, if he had better access to health care, better access to health educators, dietitians, trainers, maybe he would not be in this condition today. So this is a good example why we need a better health care system, but most importantly, why we need better access to early prevention programs. We need to educate the public, not only from becoming obese or developing diabetes or asthma, but we need to teach them how to manage their medical conditions so they can prevent some of these complications. So I just want to conclude. I really think we have a very good sickness program in this country. However, I don't think we have a very good wellness or pre prevention program. And I believe that's something that needs to change. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Tony Oliveira, I'm a supervisor in Keynes County here in Central California. And we want to welcome you to Clovis and to uh, the Central Valley. I want to thank the president for his courage for taking on the number one issue to all of us elected officials and all citizens, and that's the health and safety of our communities. Special thanks to our governors in the audience have had the courage. Dr. Oz was talking about courage. There are two governors with great courage sitting right there in that audience. I want to give special thanks to Governor Schwarzenegger because he was one of the first to recognize that at the end of the day, regardless of where you work, you go home to local communities. And in the audience today behind me are citizens and city councilmen and county supervisors. It is disheartening to travel through our communities and see people on park benches and in malls that are amputees from the battle, not of war, but the battle of preventable diabetes. One of the largest taker of lives in the Central Valley is preventable diabetes. So I challenge all of us, local government, state, and the federal government, that we join in, I think, the most important public policy issue that we could band together as one, and that's health care. Dr. Oz, I gratefully send it back to you. Thank you very, very much, Clovis. Well, we've had a very rich conversation. We're having a rich conversation about some of the problems and about some of the solutions. But let's face it, I think all of us are asking that big question, how do we get this done? A lot of us have been here before. And I think we believe in Washington that one of the most important things is having an open and transparent conversation, really having engagement, having people participate. So I have a question for you, and I, I want to call on various members of the audience to answer it. How do you want to become or continue to be involved in this health reform conversation? How do you want policy leaders in Washington and in the states around the country to hear from you and to hear your ideas? So I'm going to call on some people, raise your hands, and we'll have people with mics um, come to you. And uh, why don't we start right here? I want to hear about how you want to be involved in this reform debate, how we're going to get this moving with your involvement. I'll begin with something that I live by. If we do what we always did, then we'll always be what we are. For health reform to happen, we need to change how we think about health. I love the sickness analogy. By, in 30 years, our senior population will go to 20%. In 40 years, people over 65 will be increased by 50%. It's 85 five times and centurions 10 times. Because of the good sickness policies we have, the technologies we have and reward people for, that is the way to save life, we'll have babies that live with significant disabilities, people from accident, illness, 
and disease as well as war, and then aging. But yet our system hasn't looked at how we're going to integrate beyond institutionalization long-term care for those individuals. So we can talk about reform in health and wellness, and that means folks who already have pre-existing conditions that may cause those secondary responsibilities they have to be healthy, but they are paralyzed or they are deaf or they are blind or they are developmentally disabled, and we need to look at how we're going, and they are aging, and the option of aging isn't, not aging isn't good. So we want to look at how we can get there, and it won't be the way we are here now. We have to change how we think about delivery systems and how we move from institutionalizing people who have significant limitations in health, such as nursing homes and looking at more home care, which is cheaper. I want to be involved by advocating for individuals who produce, pay taxes, but happen to have those conditions where they can't get on the table to have their skin checked and end up in the hospital for two weeks at a high cost, end up with that amputation and never get the technology to run again because they're on the kind of health program that says, well, you're disabled, you don't need that. Don't get wellness information about exercise from a wheelchair or how you can learn how to read using speech. So that's how I want to be involved. Thank you. Great. That's terrific. Thank you very, very much. Why don't we go back here to the person with the blue writing on his T-shirt. My name is Anthony Wright. I'm a Director of Health Access California. We're a consumer advocacy group here. And I know there's been a lot of talk about stakeho uh, stakeholders, and we believe that the patients and the consumers are not st just stakeholders. They're the point of health care reform. Um, and I know there's a lot of talk about uh, responsibility, but I think – uh, and I think individuals are ready to step up to that responsibility, but if the systems change to make that happen. And so that means we need, a, we need an insurance uh, system that has responsibility to take care of people regardless of pre-existing conditions, but also to provide affordable benefits and quality benefits and not, uh, and not leave individuals all alone at the mercy of the insurance industry. And so it would be great if, A, there was an effort to get, invo get involved voters, involved consumers, um, and also show how government can be on the side of patients with regard to as a, as a regulator of, of the insurance industry, as a negotiator for the best possible price and the best possible value, especially through group coverage, and also as a competitor in terms of a public option, that, uh, a public health coverage option so that people can have a choice. And if people can see those ways that tangibly that they will benefit from health care reform, from where, they, from where they are now and how um, health reform could benefit them, we think that there would be a lot of um, support and momentum um, by involving the key beneficiaries of health care reform. That's great. I mean, and I think you pointed to several of the values and principles that we were talking about that are important to the president, but also that level of community involvement and people um, believing that the system um, and reform can work for them, but also being engaged in making that happen. Um, why don't, we, why don't we go back here to the very back row? Hello, my name is Al Aris Mendez. I'm a chairperson for the Community Health Coun Councils in uh, uh, South Los Angeles. And we provide uh, health advocacy for folks in the community, uh, education, um, preventive programs through the CDC and through the California Endowment. Um, I, I think tactically, uh, we need to make sure that. Uh, the president and the White House empower the states and um, even the, the local communities to uh, see their support either through funding or through uh, political will, uh, the ability to make changes. Uh, specifically, I, I think that since uh, the forums that have been occurring across the country, um, those folks are obviously active and ready to, to move. I think we can piggyback on that type of tactic locally and work with um, uh, assembly, uh, assembly and state health uh, committees to really try to listen in a different way, maybe as opposed to uh, other uh, specific political groups or, or lobbying or uh, other political action. And advocacy groups, I mean, it, we need to listen to the folks down at the community to be able to um, work off of that and hopefully enact legislation that will uh, advance towards uh, prevention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And those 30,000 people that participated back in December, we can continue to build on that. And healthreform.gov is a tool that people can use um, and will, you know, help give you the tools so that you can engage people in your community and get them active. Why don't we take women in the very, very back? 
Um, my name is Louise Davis, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of a national nonprofit that gives teens the knowledge and skills they need to make healthy decisions um, called Peer Health Exchange. And I just wanted to say, as to answer your question directly, I think in our case, one thing we'd love to um, contribute and we'd love to have uh, as part of the conversation is matching existing resources that are out there with these huge, huge needs for prevention and wellness. We're focused on that specifically by provi providing health education in schools, and we do that with training rigorously college students nationally to go in and teach a comprehensive health curriculum in public high schools that lack it, which I think just as a, a way of thinking about the problem, you know, there, for prevention specifically, there are actually lots of resources within our existing communities, within schools, as one huge institution that so much of our country goes to every day, where there's huge opportunity, if we look at schools, as a way of providing wellness and prevention to make change. And I think um, some of the conversation needs to go outside of the silo of health and into education and into some of our other contexts, where we work and see just the power of college students as a starting point to deliver change on, on prevention is huge, and there's, that's just the beginning. So I, I hope that we can continue the conversation outside of health in education, use existing resources like college students, and take it from there. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I, I think that's an interesting comment as well because we've talked a lot about children. We have some very important um, advocates for children in the room, um, but also children and teens and young adults as active participants um, in this process. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, I want to go to Dr. Mitch Katz, um, who's in the room, and ask for your response to this question as well. Uh, thanks very much. It was wonderful to hear the president talk about using these forums as ways of learning what can work. We are very proud in San Francisco having created Healthy San Francisco, which is a program that provides universal coverage uh, to all uninsured people in San Francisco. Uh, we're 16 months into it, and we've already covered over 38,000 of the 60,000 uninsured people. So we're more than than halfway there. We appreciate the governor has been very helpful in his administration, uh, Kim Bell Shea, to give us the approvals we need. Uh, the program embodies a lot of the issues that people have talked about. Uh, for example, cost control. Uh, we run very tight formularies. We built no new structures. Uh, we instead are using the existing federally qualified health centers, the nonprofit hospitals. Lloyd Dean allows his hospital to provide charity care uh, for our recipients uh, so that people have a place to go. So we built nothing new. We emphasize governor prevention uh, by making it clear to our incentives all favor going for your primary care visit rather than going for needing later on much more expensive care. Uh, everybody is included, a principle that you mentioned, regardless of immigration status, regardless of pre-existing conditions, so that we have our entire pool. And our preliminary data already shows decreases in emergency room use. Uh, Dr. Oz, you talked about that. If people don't have a doctor, well, that's the reasonable thing to do. They should go to the emergency room. They have no choice. We've been able to show a dramatic decrease uh, in emergency use. So we think that that there may be ways for counties in whatever health reform comes forward. Counties have always taken care of those people who didn't have insurance to continue to play that role, but in a system way. Thank you. It's beautifully stated because when you don't have insurance, it's like coming into a, a dock without a rudder, and these rudderless ships crash into the ports of health care. Uh, and, of course, we all have to end up paying for the oil spills that result. So before we go to Oakland, let me quickly go to... to uh, a woman who runs uh, AARP, which is, of course, the big retirement organization in this country, a, a, a huge stakeholder that was a part of the governor's coalition, uh, Jenny Chin Hansen. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Oz, and, and thank you to our two governors for the amazing leadership that you have historically done. I was asked to speak to some extent on the whole issue of coverage and the fact that people do need to be all under the tent. Uh, and to make sure that as we provide coverage, whether you know, there are arguments that will always be whether or not there's a public side or, or, or the continued private side, you know, the point is coverage is absolutely crucial and that people should not uh, be denied the coverage at the time that they most need this. 
But I would like to pick up on a few of the things that uh, are pertinent to a, a membership organization of uh, 40 million people. In fact, uh, most people are not retired in our membership because we have people who are from 50 to 60 that comprise 30 percent of our membership. And one of the vulnerabilities of coverage right now are people who have lost their job during this particular economy, people who are in their 40s and uh, before they hit Medicare, that kind of limbo zone that people are in, and the fear that people have. And we were talking about some of the coverage issues. So this is something that the ability to make sure that coverage is addressed, ARP, supported the children's health uh, coverage plan. We were right behind this, and we understand that for the country to be safe, this will be important. The other point I would like to certainly bring about is the importance that was brought up, that it's not just about health care, but it's about living well. And living well with the exercise, the food, really is not about medical costs. It's about a way of living. So this speaks to a tremendous culture change that we need in our society, not to only think about transactions of physical care, medical care. Finally, the whole um, aspect of bringing schools, anthropology and into it in a, in a different way. My final comment is about um, health care costs. Oftentimes, good health care doesn't have to cost more. I think when we really look at some of the research that has been done, that when um, shared patient decision-making based on evidence uh, that you mentioned, Dr. Uh, Governor Gregor, is told, people oftentimes decide not to take th those treatments because the, um, the evidence is always not that clear. So when people are informed, and this is uh, bringing in the public and the consumer, to make sure that the right information is there. Let's not get them into a medical system that sometimes inadvertently causes secondary damage and all the mistakes may possibly be made or MRSA comes into play. People, I mean, none of us are saying this is the thing we want to do is to go into a hospital. We want great hospitals, but we don't want to go in unnecessarily. And last point to underscore what was said, chronicity is another area of prevention and long-term care is part of prevention that has to be thought differently. And I know that our state and Washington State is focusing on shifting institutional care to more community-based care. And let's do it that way so that it's more normal for people, not about institutions and not about just clinical care. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mayor Yellums, you're on. You're a social worker. You should be able to manage the group up there in Oakland. Uh, like Senator Mikulski and others who are of the social work tradition, you make wonderful legislators. So take us away. Thank you very much. Um, we were anticipating a question from you, but first of all, welcome to Oakland. Secondly, I'd like to thank President Obama for his extraordinary leadership. Thank our two distinguished governors for their tremendous leadership over time. And, and thank the California Endowment for making sure that philanthropy plays a very significant role in, in achieving the notion of a healthy community. In order to maximize our response here and to respect time, I'm going to yield to a practicing nurse who in the course of his testimony will address a myriad of issues and problems, questions that you pose and it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. Don Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Don Miller. I'm a registered nurse, and I work in the emergency department of the Swedish Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. I also sit on the executive board of SEIU 1199 Healthcare Northwest. First, I'd like to thank Governor Schwarzenegger and his staff for inviting me to speak at this forum. And I'd like to give a special acknowledgement to my governor, Christine Gregoire, for all the hard work she's done in improving health care for the children and citizens of our great state. This year is the 40th anniversary of the beginning of my ER nursing career, and I'm still on the front lines plugging away. <laughs> Some things I have noticed over these years is our emergency rooms have become more and more crowded. And actually, we have become the dumping grounds for America's broken health care system. We've also become the most expensive primary health care provider to the unfortunate in our, um, in our, in our, our states. 
um, the unemployed, those who work and have no insurance, the mentally ill, and the drug and alcohol dependent people. These are people who don't have the resources when they're healthy or when they're sick necessarily to go to the doctor. They have to decide between food, rent, or the doctor. And hope, they hope that their medical situation will just spontaneously improve. But in many times, it actually gets much worse and gets to a critical crisis state before they show up in the emergency room. There it costs ten times more than it would if we had given this money and, and, and delegated these people to clinics that could take better care of them, more efficient care of them. Um, in the area we've all talked, we have talked a lot about prevention here, and that really, really is quite important. Managing uh, chronic health problems is another thing that's really important. But an issue that we really haven't talked about much that really affects the emergency rooms is is addressing the mental health issues and the drug and alcohol dependency problems. And until we address those, these folks are tying up. These folks are tying up critical care beds in our emergency room, which hampers how quickly we can deal with trauma, heart attacks, and strokes. But these other folks need help. And a lot of times the help they need is the funding of the programs that keep them out of the emergency departments. Just recently I took care of a mental health patient who has been working, had insurance, and having a very stable life, but then they lost their job and they lost their health coverage. They cannot afford the $1,100 a month for their psych medicines. And as a result, this person was in our ER twice with, pro with problems related to that, which cost much more than getting this person that prescription. We also have this problem with the alcohol and drug rehab services. The dollars are drying up, and I think we have to really pay special attention to this because if we don't do that, like I said, these people are going to be occupying critical care beds, and they are. And the homeless. Just recently, we had, a, we had a homeless person come into our ER three nights in a row, different crews, so they weren't familiar with them, with very vague complaints like chest pain or a headache, which require extensive workups. Also keeps the person there all night. And if you're homeless, that's a nice place to be in a warm place. But it's the most expensive way of treating that. Thousands and thousands of dollars this person ran up every night before we figured out this is a homeless person. You know, we don't have we don't have the resources necessarily to take care of that, but here they are in the emergency room. So I think we really need to evaluate those programs, especially in this this budget. You know, we can't cut our nose off in spite of our face. We can't decrease funding to these essential programs because it will come back and bite us, believe me. John Miller, thank you very much. And thank you, Oakland, for being part of this. Uh, one, of, one of the other coalition of the willing uh, that I wanted to introduce today is uh, Marion Wright Edelman, who did a lot of work on kids' coverage. And one of the things that I am proudest of that I'm involved with is a group called Health Corps, based on the governor's father-in-law's program, the Peace Corps. And we have programs here in California. But these programs actually send college graduates into high schools to share that passion they have for life. And I think using a problem, childhood obesity, as a solution by making those kids knowledgeable activists about health in the country is one way of addressing this, but it takes advantage of our biggest resource. Uh, can you speak to that issue as well? Well, I'm very proud to be here. I am very, thank you. Thank you. I support so fully the President's call for universal health coverage for everybody. Long overdue, and I hope we'll all work to get it this year, but I especially applaud his call for a child health mandate and for coverage for every children, child. Now, I'm so glad we signed CHIP, that the President signed CHIP and that the Congress passed it, but that is not the child health mandate that we must have. I applaud what you're doing in Washington State. We think that every child, wherever they live and whoever their parent is, whatever their state, should have guaranteed access to health coverage um, at 300% of poverty with the right to buy in, so I'm so glad that you have already moved there. I think that every pregnant mother um, must have health care wherever she lives. We have 800,000 uninsured pregnant women. We know how much more low, end, low birth weight babies cost than normal weight babies, and so it will save money. And we hope that every child will have comprehensive benefits, including mental health benefits. There are hundreds of thousands of children who are at risk of being put into juvenile court juvenile detention facilities solely because they can't get mental health coverage in their community. 
We have 9 million uninsured children. The CHIP bill would cover about 4 million. Um, we did not get um, coverage for everybody, but now in this new context, I hope that all 9 million will get it. I hope that we will get guaranteed prenatal care for all pregnant women. I hope that the system will be simple. The CHIP bill did not make the system's reforms. We still have two separate sets of benefits, one guaranteed to Medicaid children, not guaranteed to CHIP children. So this is the time to end the lottery of geography. God did not make two classes of children. So wherever they live, whoever their parents are, let's guarantee them all comprehensive care. I'm so proud of our country, but I think that we can be even prouder I am not proud that 62 nations have lower infant mortality rates than we do, including Sri Lanka. I am not proud that over 100 countries have lower low birth weight babies and rates than we do, including Algeria and Botswana. And I'm not proud that black U.S. women are more likely to die from pregnancy and childbirth complications than women in Turkmenistan. We can do better, and this is the year we can all come together, all children. Thank you very much. So, someone knows this quote better than I do, but Martin Luther King said the greatest uh, prejudice of all, the, the greatest segregation of all was in health disparities because you don't ever get a chance to get out of the starting gate. So we can argue about whether you have, a, a, have the right to health, but you certainly have the right to a chance for health, and thanks for what you're doing. There's a testimonial that I've heard so much about uh, from Governor Staff that I, I really wanted to hear her story before uh, the session ended. Marcy Martinez uh, tells me that, um, that she was in no man's land. Hi, I'm here on behalf of my father, Joe Martinez, who was a, a diabetic. Um, he got really sick and was working for many years for low-income housing for Sacramento. Um, he got an amputation and was still on his company's um, health care service. After that, um, he could no longer go back to work, so his health care coverage ran out. Um, so we decided to go through the Medi-Cal system. It, it took us about six to eight months to get him... Um, permanently disabled after his uh, lower than knee amputation. During that six month period, he got so sick that he could no longer get up on his own or even fit into his prosthesis after his amputation. Um, things just got worse. He also had um, heart disease. So those six months took a long toll on him. We lost the battle um, January 1st of this year. I lost him. So if his story can do any kind of change, I am more than honored to be here and to share his story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, we all know these stories are very painful to hear. Uh, unfortunately, we've all heard them from friends of ours. It's great to get it out in the public so we can talk about it. There's one last member of this coalition of the willing that I want to introduce, Carmen uh, Dr. Dr. Nabarez, Carmen by first name, uh, does a lot of work on population-based work. And, you know, the governor spoke earlier about how impactful prevention is. But, you know, if that's such a soft topic, right? I mean, if you're already eating right and already doing the right things, then what difference would it make? Well, then, I mean, how did California get a smoking rate of 14%, which is so dramatically lower than where I live in New York? And having been involved in the battles in other parts of the country, I know that you're way down there. Second lowest, I understand, second to Utah, which is a real tribute. Well, it happens not because you do things... Coincidentally, you, it, you do it because you guys made it easy to do the right thing. That's what prevention is really about. And I'd love to hear your story on that. Thank you, Dr. Oz. It really is an honor. California was the first state to take on tobacco, and we took it on very seriously. First, we passed a tax, and we made, ta made tobacco expensive. But the next thing is that coalitions formed across the state with the help of foundations and others to really get the work on the ground moving very fast and very rapidly. And now in California, there are very few places where it is convenient to smoke. So that's one of the things you do. You change the environment in which people live in order to make it easier for them to make the healthy choice. There's just one last thing. You know, stress is one of the things that everybody talks about as hurting your health but it's stress without hope that hurts it even more. Studies are coming in from all over the world that tell us this. So if the president's stimulus is successful, one of the things that we'll see is people with jobs and with hope. 
and that will also go a great way to improve the health of this nation. Thank you. So we've heard from our leadership on this issue. Let me go back to them with one last question. It also came from healthreform.gov from Elizabeth in Venice, California, just down the street. I think it's a great question to end this discussion with. Melanie, you spoke earlier about how you know, our voices to the, to the president and to each of our governors about what we need to see in order to help. I'll challenge each of you with her question. What she says is, is that we've got a, a, an obligation to help the millions without insurance and to make it affordable and the like. How do we help? What do we need to do to make this work easier for you? Because I think the biggest untapped resource we have in America are Americans. It's our greatest resource. It always has been. What do we need to do to play a more active role to help each of you as governors and also in Washington uh, to help the president make this change happen? Governor Schwarzenegger. Well, thank you. Um, I think that the most important thing for us is now to get together and to use this year as the year of reform. And I think that I challenge Democrats and Republicans, independents and decline to state, everyone to put aside their political ideology and to go in to do what is best for the state and what is best for the country. And I think that if we also go and bring together all the stakeholders, as you could see, there's so many different groups of people that have commented today. Each one of them has a very interesting story and is interesting ideas. I have dealt with health care reform now for two years solid, and I've learned new things here today. So I want to say thank you to the people that have contributed, and thank you for the great ideas. And it just shows that you cannot move forward and do health care reform if you don't include those voices. If it is consumer groups or if it is doctors, if it is hospital administrators, if it is labor leaders, if it is business leaders, everyone has something to offer this. I think it's very important. So we as a state will do everything that we can to partner with the Obama administration and to bring everyone together to make it uh, possible to have a successful reform this year. So this is, I think, the key thing that we have to do because then if we have true reform, and if we include all of those kind of problems, I think that we can do it and eliminate those problems. Uh, if it is the problem that you talked about uh, earlier, so that we don't have that many, uh, you know, people suffer and die and have childbirth and so, uh, or if it is like, for instance, the nurse uh, in Oakland was talking about some interesting aspect about the, the drug addicts who come in and occupy beds that we can do better, the dealing with mental patients and so. So I think there was just fabulous ideas that we do. So I think healthcare reform now, action now, and prevention now. Thank you very much. Well, just as, thank you. Just as a follow-up to that, the last time I was involved in one of these was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, when we did a summit in Los Angeles again. And the one thing I walked away from, which I haven't seen yet in most other parts of the country that I visited, is it, made, it was very clear to me, and I hope it is to everybody here, that the train was leaving. You can pick what boxcar you want to get on, but the train is leaving. And I think that mindset is what my takeaway message from today's session is with you, Governor. Melanie. Well, I want to pick up actually right there. I think in this room today, we've heard all the reasons why we have to do this now. Today is April the 6th. If you look at your calendar, to get this in front of the president by the end of this year, you'd think, oh, we've got about seven months. We actually probably have fewer than 100 days. Now, there are two reactions to that. You can think, oh, can't do that. That's not going to work. There's some people might look at that and think, oh, it's an opportunity maybe to stop health care reform from happening. I say, I say, and the president believes quite the opposite. That means that we have 100 days in order to change our health care system. We have all of the relevant people sitting around the table. We have support, bipartisan support from around the country and on Capitol Hill. We have all of you. The question you asked, Dr. Oz, was how do we become involved? Go back to your communities. Continue this conversation. Get people engaged. Go to healthreform.gov and lodge your opinions, your thoughts, your insistence that this has to happen. Go back and start those community conversations and talk to your representatives, your, your senators, and tell them why this has to happen. People respond to that. This me could mean that it's 100 days from this not happening, or it could mean, it will mean, it must mean 
that in 100 days, we will have answers. We will be on the road towards a better health care system that will help resolve some of the problems and challenges, some of the pain that many people in this room have expressed and people around the country are also expressing by bringing our health care costs down and by bringing people into a quality and affordable system so that we can change and improve lives. 100 days, we can do it. So thank you very, very much. And thank you, Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Gregoire. Governor Gregoire. Well, I look back at a missed opportunity uh, where we tried health care reform once before and we failed. And the last thing I want to do, at least for my two daughters, is look back and say we failed again. We cannot afford it as a nation. We cannot have, Marin Wright Edelman, the statistics you provided about other countries, we need to lead we need to look at this as comprehensive health care reform. It can't be just a part of the system. It needs to be comprehensive health care reform, which means quality. We deserve, we must demand higher quality care. Affordability. We cannot afford it from the individual to the business to the government. We have got to lower the cost of health care in this, in this country. And thirdly, we've got to make sure we have universal access. To do that, that means the whole person the physical person and the mental health of the person. That means all of our people, whether we're a senior citizen or a child, we've got to look at this as an opportunity not to be lost and at all of the spectrum of health care and all of the ages of the people that we serve. My best advice, my ask, is please don't accept anything less than that. And that means everybody here and everybody around the country, your voices are important. They are critical right now. Let every member of your delegation hear from you, every member of your legisla legislature, every governor, every member of the, gov of the president's cabinet, that we want health care reform. We will accept nothing less. This country deserves a health care system that works for its people. A high five on that. <laughs> it's like a pep rally. So I, I'm charged with one, one homework assignment. It's a very small assignment, but it comes from, from, from everybody who's been involved in this process. Tip O'Neill, the famous legis legislature leader of the House of Representatives, was famed for saying that all, all politics is local, right? But all health care is personal. There's just no way that they can do it in Washington or in Sacramento or Olympia or anywhere else. It doesn't frankly matter. It's not going to happen if we don't do it ourselves. That website up there, healthreform.gov, or if you live in California, do it at gov.ca.gov is going to be hosting uh, opportunities for you to have a con uh, conversation. We work with Facebook and, and MySpace. There's a lot of information that's being sent out across the waves today. Please be part of a conversation. Pull together your ideas. Send it back to our leaders so they know how to act. We're not looking for consensus, but we need clarity. Let's figure out where the real action points are, the pressure points to make this happen. And thank you very much for being part of today. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful speaker.